Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the NNLM Social Determinants of Environmental Health webinar series. We are so glad that you were able to join us today for this session about how climate change is affecting Alaska. And as people are entering the room, I just want to let you know that you are free to say where you're from in the chat. I'm Carolyn Martin, your host for today's session, and my pronouns are she and they. And I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the NNLM Region 5. And assisting with technical aspects is Molly Knapp from the NNLM National Training Office. And my colleagues Liz Morris, Emily Hamstra, and Cecilia Burns are also here to assist. We have just a few technical items to cover before we get started. We do have a live captioner today, and closed caption has been embedded or enabled and is available by selecting Show Captions at the bottom menu. Depending on the size of your screen, you may need to click on the three dots where it says More and then select Caption. All attendees have been muted, but we welcome your questions and comments in the chat at any time. And we will have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when posting your questions and comments in the chat so that everyone can see them. We're recording today's session and it will be available in various places on the NNLM website, including the accompanying series guide in about a couple of weeks or so. And as a reminder, by registering for this webinar, all attendees have agreed to abide by the NNLM Code of Conduct. It's a reminder that we are all here together professionally, and we want to be inclusive and respectful. Your cooperation is much appreciated. The Code of Conduct is also available on our website, and the link is in the chat. This class is eligible for 1.5 Medical Library Association Continuing Education Credits, which you will be able to claim through the evaluation link that we will have that will have the MLA CE code. The session is also eligible for Competencies for Health Education Specialists, or CHES, C-H-E-S. Just know that you will need your CHES ID to complete the evaluation. And speaking of evaluation, your feedback matters to us and helps us to improve future trainings. So please take a moment to complete it, whether you want the CE or not. And more information will be provided at the end of the webinar. I know that some of you are already familiar with us, but for those who aren't, I'd like to share a little bit about who we are. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Many of you might be more familiar with the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM is the network of the National Library of Medicine. It is an outreach program of NLM working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities for over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. And here's a map to show you how our regional medical libraries are geographically divided. If you would like to learn more about your region and how your organization can become part of the network, visit our website at nnlm.gov, and the link is in the chat. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Sarah Yoda received her bachelor's and master's degrees in environmental health from Colorado State University. She worked for the Alaska Department of Health for over 10 years in roles that included managing the state's health impact assessment and environmental public health programs. Sarah is currently with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, also known as ANTHC, where she leads the Center for Climate and Health and is working with communities to understand the connections between climate change and community health and to provide support when planning for or responding to impacts. 
The title of Sarah's presentation is Climate Change in Health in Alaska, Addressing Inequities and Building Resilience. So welcome, Sarah. I'm gonna go ahead and let you share your screen and we look forward to your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to talk to you all today. I am talking to you all from the traditional lands of the Dena'ina in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, having a sunny day here, which is lovely. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I have worked in the past on health impact assessment, environmental public health, now on climate and health. So I'm really excited to talk about pretty much all those topics today. It's one of my favorite, um, favorite things. So we'll be talking about climate change and health in Alaska. And uh, just for a quick overview of where we'll be headed today, um, cover the objectives briefly, provide a little bit about the organization that I work in, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, talk about some of the climate impacts in Alaska, as well as some of the climate health concerns and challenges that are unique to the state. And then we'll talk about pre-existing inequities and disparities and how those intersect with climate change and then provide some examples of some response efforts um, throughout the state. So just here are the objectives for the talk. Um, I won't go and read all of them because I believe they were in the materials um, in advance of this lecture. So in short, I hope to provide some information about how certain populations can be more vulnerable to health impact from climate change, um, in part due to social and economic disparities, talk about several things going on in Alaska um, that work on improving these disparities and minimizing health impacts from climate change, and then provide an example of why it's important to talk about social determinants of health when we're talking about climate adaptation. Okay, so it's set a stage of um, some unique facts about Alaska, why things um, might look a little different in terms of climate um, and health in the state. And a lot of what I'm sharing today um, are images from two reports. One was from the Alaska Native Tri Tribal Health Consortium called the Unmet Needs Report. It was released earlier this year. I'll talk a little bit about that later on in this talk. Um, and then also the uh, National Climate Assessment, the fifth version that was released um, in the fall of 2023. I was involved in um, the health part of the Alaska chapter. So I pulled some images from that and I'll, I'll be mentioning that in the talk. So this image, it's not super readable, um, but I think it makes some good points. So I'll read out um, some of these facts about current Alaska, current rural Alaska by the numbers. So approximately 60% uh, of Alaska communities are not connected to the road system. That's really interesting when you think about the fact that Alaska is um, one fifth the size of the lower 48. Um, it's a very large state, and not a lot of roads. Um, within Alaska, 40% or 40% of federally recognized tribes are located in Alaska. Uh, there's a lot of conversation, I'm sure many of you have heard about the costs of living in Alaska from food costs to heating costs. Um, in No Attack Alaska, um, which is in Western Alaska, the um, price of heating oil was $16 a gallon in May, 2022. Um, the cost of living in rural Alaska is 32% higher than the national average. Um, and then the average population of communities in rural Alaska is less than 500. So very isolated, but also very small, um, which really leads to you know, some um, interesting uh, challenges related to capacity and some other things that I'll talk about. And then really important to um, the conversation about climate and health of the 144 environmentally, environmentally threatened communities facing infrastructure impacts from erosion, flooding, and permafrost law, 95% 95, 95 of those are economically disadvantaged. So we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that um, as we go on. Okay, so the um, a little bit about the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Let me change my view so I can see my notes. So the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, um, it is a non-private tribal health organization and it is designed to meet the unique needs of the Alaska Native and American Indian people living in Alaska. Um, in partnership with the Alaska Native and American Indian people that NTHC serves, as well as the tribal health organizations of the Alaska tribal health system, um, ANTHC provides health services, uh, which include 
comprehensive medical services at the Austin Native Medical Center, wellness programs, disease research and prevention, rural provider training, and rural water and sanitation systems construction. So ANTHC takes a pretty holistic approach to health um, in that it has you know, this traditional uh, medical center with a hospital, but it also has community health services, um, support services, um, more on the like finance and people management side, as well as the division of environmental health and engineering, which is where I am, I am placed. Um, within this division, uh, programs focus on water, sanitation and utility infrastructure needs, um, and also provide technical assistance, training and support on projects that can improve the environmental health in communities, including, including uh, climate related impacts. So ANTHC um, is the largest, most comprehensive tribal health organization in the United States. And it is Alaska's second largest health employer with more than 3000 employees. So within the Division of Environmental Health and Engineering, there is Community Environment and Health. Um, this pro or this department looks a lot like a environmental public health program would look like in other organizations, such as the State Health Department. We provide um, you know services such as air quality, healthy homes, work, um, looking into contaminated sites and you know, hazardous exposure issues. Um, we provide emergency preparedness support um, as well as field services support. And what that means is we have um, a number of folks who go out to communities to work with water plant operators, do inspections of things like the water treatment plants, um, health clinics, wastewater lagoons, that type of thing, and just really help provide support to communities to keep those really crucial systems running. Um, we also provide uh, capacity and training support to tribes. And then we have a new program called the Climate Initiatives Program, and that's where I work. So in the Climate Initiatives Program, uh, we work to coordinate activities across ANTHC to support the Alaska Tribal Health System in finding uh, healthy ways to adapt to our changing world. Uh, we assess the unique community environment and assist in planning for adaptation, mitigation, relocation, and future climate-related uh, initiatives. We uh, work to advocate for equitable climate solutions and approaches for all of our 229 tribes in our state. And we are advocating for equitable climate response at the international level as well. Within the Climate Initiatives Program, there are two centers. Um, they are the Center for Environmentally Threatened Communities and the Center for Climate and Health. So in the Center for Environmentally Threatened Communities, um, this center provides communities with more of the direct support for infrastructure related challenges um, you know, surrounding climate change. So they support communities um, in figuring out how to maybe protect in place, retreat or relocate to a new community. Um, they provide capacity building, technical assistance, um, including assistance with community planning, um, funding acquisition, grant management, um, a number of really uh, important um, support systems to uh, tribes and communities. Um, the center has supported over 40 communities um, with um, over 150 projects. Um, so there's very active, um, very busy people. <laughs> and they punish, they published the unmet needs report for environmentally threatened Alaska Native villages um, in January 2024. And I will talk about that study a little bit later. The other center in the Climate Initiatives Program is the Center for Climate and Health, and that's um, the center that I direct. Um, we are pretty broad in what we do. A lot of One Health work, you know, really um, raising awareness about the interconnectedness between human health, animal health, environmental health, you know, just how um, crucial it is to support the health of all to, you know, have more healthy and resilient um, people. Um, we release some newsletters about observations happening um, around the Arctic that relate specifically to climate and health. In the past, we've done some climate and health assessments, um, as well as some adaptation planning. And we also operate the local environmental observer network, um, LEO network, which I will talk about a little later. But the the quick of that is that it is a um, online system for environmental observers, like you know people around the around the state, to provide um, observ 
share their observations of environmental change where they live. Okay, so set the stage a little bit about some of the organizations um, in ANTHC and um, a little bit about living in rural Alaska. So now I wanted to share um, briefly some of the current trends and impacts in Alaska related to climate change. This is all generalities. Um, with each trend, there's some nuance um, with it. So um, just keep that in mind. So Alaska um, is warming two to three times faster than the global average. Um, this is causing a lot of impacts, um, as well as you know just other changes globally that is impacting Alaska and other Arctic nations. So trends we're seeing is increased precipitation, um, generally in the form of more frequent and severe precipitation events um, that can cause flooding and erosion. Increased precipitation doesn't necessarily mean we won't ever have droughts or anything. We're getting warmer, so water is evaporating. So um, increased precipitation, not always all bad, but um, it doesn't always mean what we think. <laughs> um, and we still may have some, you know, some water quantity issues as well. Um, we have seen increased wind speeds, um, and these high wind speeds can amplify the impact of storms. Um, that's really critical, especially in areas that no longer have some of the um, protections that they used to from big storm events, such as um, sea ice that used to um, kind of protect a community from storm surges. We've seen rising air temperatures, um, and this can lead to a variety of things such as permafrost thaw um, and loss of sea ice. Um, and as I mentioned, that loss of sea ice really um, can Im impact communities as this um, buffer around the coastline um, declines and we have more severe storms coming closer into communities and causing um, larger impacts. And then sea level rise. Um, I think we all understand the potential impacts of sea level rise. Um, interestingly, not happening everywhere in Alaska yet, there's also some sea level decline um related to the melting of glaciers and the ground rebounding but um you know eventually we expect to see more uniform sea level rise around the state okay so i just wanted to highlight a couple of the um, recent climate driven extremes and no notable events this is an image from that national climate assessment that i mentioned um and i just wanted to share this and then the next slide to provide some scope of what things are happening around the state um, and how that may you know, impact um, the people who live here. We have seen um, really significant changes in, in the sea ice extent. Um, we have seen extremely high concentrations of harmful algal bloom cysts in the Bering Sea. Um, and that's really an issue we haven't seen much before. Um, we've seen record wet summers, um, which have provide, uh, created some unique flooding issues, as well as changes to um, how people are preserving um, some of their traditional food resources. We've seen, um, you know, as well as other states, um, impacts from the blob, that marine heat wave. Ocean acidification, um, heat waves, droughts, so a lot going on um, in the state. And then that also has led to some major recent ecological changes. And this image is also from the National Climate Assessment from the Alaska chapter. Um, you know, just sharing some of the things that have impacted the wildlife um, and vegetation. And these things, of course, can then impact um, humans who use these resources. So we've seen um, issues with salmon runs, as well as, you know, you've seen in other states. We've seen unusual mort mortality events in the Bering Sea of seals and birds, um, issues with crab. Um, as well as recent record salmon runs. So not, not all changes have been bad right now. Um, expansion of some, uh, of some land mammals, but then also some shifting and migration patterns. Um, and then we are seeing things like spruce beetle impacting our forests um, in at least South Central Alaska. So a lot of different ecological changes um, that are happening. So if you think about the ecological changes, you think about those weather changes, you can really start to see the, the scope and the magnitude of you know, what um, people are facing in Alaska. 
just wanted to share two images just to provide some um, more visual of some of these impacts. I think they're really impactful. This is a photo um, of the community of Buckland during a spring flooding event. Um, this occurred in 2021, um, but um, this community as well as many others around the state have dealt with spring flooding events as um, the rivers melt and ice jams form. Some of this is natural and occurs anyway, um, but some of this is changing um, in response to a changing climate. Um, also important to note that, you know, when this happens in many communities that are on river systems, they're also not connected to a road system. So it can be really challenging to get um, adequate support um, to a community to help them respond. Um, this is a photo of a home in the community of Chifornik, which is in Southwest Alaska. Um, and this home um, was damaged by permafrost degradation. Clearly a lot of things going on um, in this picture that has really impacted the stability of this home and has made it unlivable. Um, you know, the house is no longer level, doors no longer shut. Um, and, you know, it looks like even more change can happen if there's further degradation of that area. And in a lot of communities where these housing issues are happening, um, you know, as permafrost changes or other changes are happening in their community, they're really faced with housing shortages. There's, you know, not great alternatives to new homes. And there's a lot of complex things going on, such as land ownership. Um, but it's really hard if something like this happens to a home to have another place to go. Um, and it may result in, you know, a family moving in with a different family. And then, you know, you have some crowding issues and some other impacts. So just wanted to provide some of that for some perspective. So when you think about these different climate trends and impacts that I shared, you know, such as rising temperatures, precipitation changes, permafrost thaw, um, none of that is happening on its own. So it is happening um, in, you know, a landscape where it's it, interacting with um, different um, contexts of, you know, human and uh, human life, such as the like environmental and institutional context. Um, food systems changing, land use changing, management assistance resources, all of those are being impacted by these climate drivers. The social and behavioral path context um, is really important to consider here. Um, you know, things like housing issues, uh, systemic racism and discrimination, historical trauma, pre-existing health um, conditions, adaptive capacity. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these um, in the next few slides. And then, you know, just the way people are exposed to some hazards changes um, as well. Um, infrastructure damage can lead to water and sanitation problems that could then lead to some health risks. So a lot of these are interacting with each other um, to influence health risks um, to people living in Alaska. Um, this is also from the National Climate Assessment, this image, but I thought it was a great way to capture like how interconnected all of this is um, in Alaska and of course in other locations as well. Pops for a drink. Okay. So one thing I did want to highlight from that social and you know environmental context um, is really the importance in Alaska about the connection to the natural environment. Um, the Alaska Native people have a really distinct connection to and understanding of the natural environment, um, the land, sea, um, and other natural resources are really critical for everything from economic activities to food security and food sovereignty, uh, health, culture, and overall well-being. Um, when you combine this really deep connection to the to the natural environment with the geographical isolation of many communities. Um, can lead to communities being particularly vulnerable to health impacts from a changing climate, but it also can lead to a really resilient community, you know, as they um, really uh, lean in their strength, their connection to the natural environment um, and have some unique ad adaptive strategies. Okay. So in thinking about, you know, the different climate and health concerns, that I hear about um, from community members um, 
what has come up a lot recently have been impacts to food security and food sovereignty. And if you recall back to the slide about all the different changes to you know, salmon runs and migration patterns of um, you know, mammals, all these different things um, are on people's minds um, and are you know, big concerns when they're thinking about food security and food sovereignty. When you have changing precipitation patterns, um, it really impacts people's traditional practices. Um, and it can impact things such as how food is dried and stored. Um, we've heard that in the wetter summers, people have had difficulties um, drying the fish that they would be putting up for winter. Um, it also impacts storage. The photo here is um, kind of hard to really see what's going on, but this is a flooded ice cellar. Um, so as you know, permafrost is changing and other impacts to the land are happening, um, things like these ice cellars are being impacted. Um, another thing that um, comes up around food security and food sovereignty is really that decreased access to, so are they able to use um, their, you know, um, does the way they access resources change? Are they able to go out on to a river in the winter? Is the, rent is the ice as predictable as it used to be? Um, if there's no sea ice, you know, it could be diff more difficult to get to other areas. Um, the quality of some resources has been changing and the quantity has as well. So um, other things that have come up in um, recent conversations with people has been concerned about new or increased wildlife changes, um, especially those related to, you know, changing geographic ranges of some issues um, such as, um, you know, seeing more harmful algal blooms in um, the marine environment in Alaska, um, seeing potential changes to rabies outbreaks, um, potential for, you know, changing tick-borne disease um, coming into Alaska. So those types of questions. Um, and it is really hard to see some of these before it happens because there are limited surveillance systems related to wildlife health. And I will talk about that. Um, in a couple of slides. Um, another thing, um, what we've been really fortunate the past couple summers haven't been quite as bad um, all around, but um, anytime there's wildfire smoke, um, especially in interior Alaska, there are concerns about exposure because um, there's really not a lot of alternative locations to go when you're off the road um, in a community and homes are designed to be really tight. So they're keeping in heat. Um, but you know, people really want to. Some people want to open the windows to cool off. But then there's um, wildfire smoke that then people can be exposed to. So um, that has come up um, in a lot of conversations. Okay, so just a little bit. There's a lot of different other things that can happen. You know, other impacts that climate can have on health in Alaska. But that would take a long time. So just highlighting a few. Now I want to shift from thinking about, um, you know, the social context, the env environmental context, um, changes to the, you know, ecological systems in Alaska, um, different health challenges happening, and then kind of overlaying that with existing issues. So um, climate change can exacerbate existing health challenges and create new ones. So um, social and economic in inequities can um, come up as climate, you know, is impacting a community. Um, you may have damage to a home, for example, and some people are able to, um, you know, get, get a fix and move on and others, you know, it could be too much of an economic burden. They might not even have someone in the community that can fix whatever um, is um, not working or needs repair. Um, Pre-existing health disparities are also important to consider. Um, I'll have a few slides about that. Um, and um, all the things that are happening it, related to like, climate and health is not happening alone. There are other things going on in the community. There's other things going on in the state. Um, and so a lot of these are cumulative and compounding impacts that you know, can really impact um, an individual person's or community's um, capacity to respond. So, you know, one example is you know, during 
um, the COVID pandemic, there were you know communities who were really stretched to deal with impacts of the pandemic, but were also still having flooding problems and um, had to you know it's it's hard to to handle both, um, especially when the community is small and um, traditionally would have to bring in people from other regions to assist, but they were having travel bans. Um, so a lot of complicated things that can happen around climate change and health that I wanted to highlight um, today. So talking about some pre-existing inequities, um, you know, not every community looks the same. Um, there are some communities that still um, have a lack of indoor plumbing. Um, there are concerns and some issues in some communities already with food and water insecurity. Um, there are issues of overcrowding in some homes, lack of alternative housing options, limited transportation options, and limited medical access, um, and that's significant geographical isolation. So um, I will provide an example on the next slide of how climate change can exacerbate some of these inequities um, and create new ones. Um, one example to share right now, um, that lack of alternate housing options. Um, there are some communities that know they want to relocate, but it is difficult or even impossible to identify land that is appropriate to meet their needs um, where they can have all their homes. And, you know, this is obviously a very distressing when you know you need to relocate, but don't know, really know where to go and trying to find a solution. Um, very tricky. Um, and again, I did mention this in the previous slide, so just, you know, there are limited options to respond to additional disturbances. If you're dealing with some of these problems already, you have a um, climate related emergency, you have another type of emergency, it um, can be really um, a large burden for a community to respond to. So this slide um, shows a, um, a picture of damage from uh, ex-typhoon Murbach, um, which occurred in 2022. So this typhoon um, crossed over the Aleutian Islands and then hit uh, Southeast Alaska. Um, it's a very rare thing for this type of storm to do. Um, and it caused widespread damage um, for hundreds of miles. Um, homes were flooded, um, a lot of infrastructure was damaged. There was a lot um, happening. Um, a major disaster was declared in a large stretch of Western Alaska. Um, and there were, you know, FEMA came out to help respond. There was a lot of, you know, emergency response happening um, right after the event. But one thing that happened that was, um, I think, a little unique in the state is an issue with fish camps. So typhoon happened, a lot of damage was happening. People weren't, um, especially people from other, other states, really weren't talking much about damage to fish camps. Um, but these fish camps, um, some had been wiped out. They are where a family, you know, may have gone every year of their lives to go out and get food. Um, for their families and for their community, and all of a sudden these camps were gone. Um, once people start talking more about fish camp and raise awareness, you have winter, which uh, kind of covers some of the damage. Um, and then later on, as the snow melts, people are really just reminded again of how much infrastructure has been damaged, um, the fact that those fish camps are no longer there. And um, during the event, FEMA did not really see these fish camps as infrastructure um, that would be um, uh, eligible for emergency response funds. And it was a lot of um, work by a lot of great people, um, you know, working with some of our elected officials to really show the importance of including um, less typical things like fish camps into um, emergency response um, work. Okay, so I want to talk about a little bit about pre-existing health disparities. Um, you know, this is an issue 
of course, in other locations, um, but there are some unique things um, in, in Alaska, such as limited access to healthcare. Um, there are often a health aid in most rural communities, but um, most care, you know, beyond the what can be done via telehealth and, you know, um, any anything like complex, someone needs to fly out or somehow get some other type of transportation to a larger community, um, maybe a hub community, or maybe they have to come all the way into Anchorage. Um, one example of this is when there is someone who is pregnant. Um, if in rural communities, um, these people need to go to um, a community with a hospital for the last month of their um, term. So, you know, if there's any issues um, with early, um, going into labor early, or any issues with the childbirth birthing process, that they're in the hospital to get um, services. So that um, obviously can be a, a really challenging time if your last month of pregnancy, you are in a community that is not your own, away from your family. Um, and I can only imagine, you know, if there's a big climate related event happening, like a big storm, and you're, you know, kind of cut off from your community, how distressing that can be. We have limited access to mental health services across Alaska. Um, I know it's a challenge in, you know, many states. Um, overlaying with that, we do have disparities in rates of suicide among um, uh, young people in particular on the state. Um, and some communities do have behavioral health aids, but uh, I do not believe it's the vast majority. And even if you are a behavioral health aid in a community, um, there's that tricky factor of, you know, people trusting you to, to talk to you about um, issues going on, especially if you may know everyone in their family um, because the community is so small. So all of these different health disparities can, of course, be exacerbated by climate change. Um, you know, just that feeling of anxiety um, about unknown change in the land that you are so connected to that can cause, you know, health, um, like a physical health response that can increase anxiety. Um, and if there's already limited access to services, you know, that can really um, be, be a huge impact in a community. So that's just a couple of examples of some pre-existing health disparities in Alaska and um, some ways that they can be exacerbated by climate change. Um, now go into some of the more on the response side. So knowing we have these potential impacts, we have these potential disparities, what might be going on around the state um, to kind of react to some of those things. So one really important thing um, I wanted to share um, is it's really critical um, to consider environmental and social determinants of health when developing a climate ad adaptation strategy. So if you know there's a certain potential impact from climate change and you want to help a community prepare for or respond to that, um, you really need to have a great understanding of the, the people in a community and, you know, what kind of context already is in play in that community in terms of some of these determinants of health. So I talked a little bit earlier about the wildfire smoke example, just like knowing how homes are built in a community and how, you know, many of these homes, um, such as, you know, interior Alaska, are built for really cold winters um, and don't have HVAC systems. So there's no way to get cooler air. Um, so people have to debate, you know, do we open the window and let in smoke or do we um, keep the windows closed and get pretty hot? Um, and we can't often in some of these communities go to a, just a store and get an air filter or, you know, something else. So there has been some great work um, by some other agencies about, you know, putting together some kind of more um, DIY air purifiers, um, another way to respond to that kind of issue. Um, water and sanitation improvements. I pull this example um, because especially in a community that already has a lack of indoor plumbing or a um, minimal indoor plumbing, when you know, you're kind of responding to infrastructure damage that may impact water and sanitation infrastructure, 
you can have a really great idea of improvements, but if you don't understand how the community really functions and what their preferences are, people may not like those improvements or may not use them. Um, especially like there have been water and sanitation improvements put in, in communities that have been um, not as successful as it maybe originally envisioned because they took up a ton of space in an already really small home um, or they were just really difficult to repair. They didn't have you know the right people or the right resources in, in the community and they just didn't last. Um, changing production, food production methods. Um, you know, some of the, the climate adaptation strategies is identifying that as the climate changes, different foods may be able to be produced in an area that you know, didn't used to be quite as um, friendly for these foods. But it's really important to understand you know, the cultural context when you're bringing in new foods into a community. Um, do people like these foods? Do they know how to use them and grow them? And um, are they able to be connected with other communities that may have this experience and they can you know, share, share knowledge? Um, and also, what does it mean if you are you know, changing from more of a um, you know, one, way, one style of using the land and interacting with resources to more of like a farming model? Like how does that work in certain communities? So things to really think about. Um, and then the last example I wanted to share is the example of you know, considering community relocation versus you know, more of a protecting in place. Uh, protecting in place, one example could be, you know, we know there's big storm surges that could impact a community and provide flooding, maybe putting up a seawall um, or other types of things that could help keep the community more protected versus just, just like total relocation of a community. And, you know, that's one where you really need to understand land use, of course, in the area, who owns what land, um, is the alternate location a place that people want to be. Um, how complicated is it to relocate an entire community? Um, and you know, understanding it takes a lot of time and a lot of monetary resources, um, and can be really complicated. So really, you know, just working with the community and um, you know, understanding their needs as much as possible before um, you know, really responding to this, the changes and providing some more adaptive, uh, adaptive strategies. Okay. So one example I wanted to share about responding to climate hazards, this is more of that water and sanitation response. Um, I'm highlighting a project that um, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium was involved in. Um, this is a mini portable alternative sanitation system or mini pass. Um, and it actually was um, installed in several communities during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic to really help with, you know, ensuring that there could be more hand washing in homes um, that, you know, traditionally might have been hauling water into their homes and really um, restricting how much they used. So this system provides a hand washing cabinet um, as well as a ventilated honey bucket, um, which is not a flushable toilet, but um, is still because it's ventilated was an improvement. Um, for homes. It brings indoor sanitation into homes that didn't have running water, um, and it can help with sanitation needs in homes that um, may be um, experiencing damage to existing water and sewer infrastructure or, um, you know, are undergoing community location and need um, some type of um, water, you know, sanitation fix before they can get more plumbed resources. And this is just a picture of a mini path system installed in a home. Um, another response is really working to address any existing data and surveillance um, challenges. Um, as I mentioned a little bit when I talked about the wildlife health um, issues, um, there's limited conventional disease surveillance system in Alaska for identifying, detecting, and monitoring climate related hazards and conditions. Um, you know, the state, as discussed, is so large um, and really difficult to be able to see and monitor everything that's happening across the state, especially in areas where you may not have a person walk by in a while, you may not um, then know what's going on in the you know, wildlife um, in the area. Um, we know that 
mental health data is particularly limited specific to climate change, especially when you um, address what's going on in rural communities. Um, there have been some great researchers that are working to improve uh, mental health data that we have around the state um, and include some um, studies specific to climate change, but it is really hard to fully capture because you know what's going on in the environment is just so um, integrated into someone's day to day. Um, how do you separate um, what you know what they're feeling in terms of the change of the environment to like how their general well-being is? So um, kind of difficult to capture mental health data, um, especially um, given some of the uh, existing disparities in, um, in the state. One tool um, that is being used to help address um, data gaps is the local environment observer network. And this is more to help address more of like the environmental change gap, not the health, mental health data, um, because the LEO network is focused on environmental change. Uh, within the system, local observers, so someone in their community um, who is just, you know, walking around, maybe driving their four by four um, or their snow machine, they can report um, any unusual environmental events um, that they see. And all these observations um, are specific to a, a time and a location. Um, and these events may be someone's personal observations or a news article um, from a region that describes a specific event. Um, so a person might see um, that there was actually a story of someone who would walk from their home to their work and they left for work and there was a lake along their way to work. And as they walked home, the lake was gone. And so they posted this and um, a feature of Leo Network is that every observation then is connected with someone who works in that field and might be able to provide some more um, information on what might have happened with the event and any response. So in the case of this lake disappearing, um, they were connected with some permafrost researchers. There was a lot of work done um, to understand what had happened. Turns out it was permafrost um, change, but also some beaver migration changes. And this beaver was new into this area. And so a variety of different things going on. It actually resulted in um, a, a scientific publication where the community observer got to be one of the authors. So it was a pretty interesting story. So Leo is a great way for you know, things that are just um, unusual, don't really know what's going on, but it's something different in someone's environment, they can post and be connected to someone who may be able to assist with, you know, learning more. It's also a great way for people to share what's going on so that people in other regions, they might read about this issue that might be predicted to come to their community. And if you're um, dealing with certain animal disease, but it hasn't quite reached your area yet, you might be able to read what's been going on in other regions. Um, so very interesting. It also, um, the Leo Network provides these news articles and um, background information on issues that um, come up more on the, um, not so much the national scale, but uh, more of the like um, community newspapers and other Arctic um, news um, to really increase awareness of, you know, things going on around, um, around the world that impact health and environmental change. So anyone can join the Leo Network. You just uh, go on to leonetwork.org and um, sign up for an account and you can um, see what's going on in Alaska. You can also, Leo Network, there's observations from other parts around the world too. So you don't have to be in Alaska to use it, um, but it is a, it can be pretty interesting to um, dive into and kind of, kind of see what's going on. Um, so we talked about the uh, some water and sanitation issues. We talked about some health surveillance challenges. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about some healthcare disparities. Um, so as we all know, um, COVID-19 highlighted some of the large disparities in healthcare access and services. That was definitely true here in Alaska. Um, it was really interesting though, um, as part of the response to the pandemic, um, new, um, or enhanced health partnerships were created. Um, some like non-traditional partnerships were made to really um, de-silo a lot of work going on around the state. And it really increased surveillance and data accessibility. You know, now you have dashboards for things and you can um, 
no real time what might be going on in a community. And a lot of this has also improved crime and health information, just being able to access data and, you know, really responding to community um, demand for and um, understanding of surveillance data has really improved. Um, which has, I, I think has been a benefit to helping us understand crime and health uh, information. And um, I think, you know, it's really important that there's a continued investment in working on minimizing these types of healthcare disparities um, because it can also increase resilience to climate related impacts uh, to help. So I wanted just to highlight something on the more positive end of things. And then my last slide about you know, some of the response going on in Alaska is this more responding to systemic inequities. Um, as I mentioned a few times, um, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium um, published this unmet needs of environmentally threatened Alaska Native villages. Um, the unmet needs report is how we shorten it. And that was in January, 2024. It's a really, it's a pretty long publication, but it is very interesting. It talks about, um, you know, it summarizes a lot of what's going on in the state in terms of uh, infrastructure issues, but also um, the barriers that communities are um, dealing with when it comes to responding to, you know, to issues in their communities, um, what types of barriers exist, you know, in funding agencies, um, that type of thing. So it's, I, if you're interested, I included a link here. Um, this image on the right is going to be a little tricky to see, but it kind of displays some of the, you know, different messages that impact communities, especially like getting funding. You, know, you have to have certain requirements met to even apply for something, and that could be a, a huge barrier to communities. So um, this report does provide some recommendations and has led to some great follow-up work. Um, so I just wanted to provide that as one example of a way to respond to some of those more systemic inequities and raise awareness about them. Okay, so that's where I'll stop. Um, feel free to provide any questions or comments. Um, and I hope that helped us all, you know, think a little bit about the different social determinants of environmental health, how those impact climate and healthcare in Alaska. And I think, you know, many of these things can relate to where, where other people are living as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. We really appreciate your presentation and um, for giving us a better understanding of um, what populations in Alaska are experiencing with climate change. Uh, I think we all had an idea, but it was really nice to have you um, expand on that for us. So now is our time um, for you to ask your questions, or if you have some comments, um, you can put them in the chat. You can also raise your hand, and we can unmute you as well. Um, I believe we have one from Janice uh, that says, is there property insurance available to assist with rebuilding affordable property? Yeah, let me rephrase that. Is there affordable property insurance uh, available to assist with rebuilding? I'm not entirely sure. I think maybe in some areas, um, I think, one particular problem in Alaska is there often is nowhere to rebuild. Um, so that is, is tricky. And I, I think um, I'm not an expert on the insurance side of, of this for, um, especially for more of the rural communities. I suspect the answer is no, but maybe there's someone on the call who knows a little bit more. I know there's a few other Alaskans on. You need to pop it in the chat if you know. <laughs> Sarah? May I uh, further explain why I asked that question? Um, in Florida, insurance companies have begun, have begun pulling out because mm -hmm. the climate, as you know, is causing more extreme weather. Are you seeing that in Alaska? Uh, seeing more extreme weather in, in Alaska? Yes, I would say so. And, and how is this impacting, uh, for example, uh, the being able to purchase or being offered? Because again, in Florida, we have four insurance companies now that have pulled out. They will not insure uh, properties in Florida because the uh, extreme weather is just causing 
I would say prohibitive costs and, and damages. Are, are we seeing any of this play out in Alaska? Yeah, from what I've heard um, from, from some people is that that is indeed happening here too. Um, you know, areas that are prone to wildfires um, and, and other issues. I think there are um, there are definitely some, some uh, insurance issues with, with keeping coverage, maintaining coverage, um, getting new coverage. Um, but again, I'm not an expert on that part, but I, I would say, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a thing here too. <laughs> Sarah, someone also mentioned that in California, insurance companies are also pulling out. Yeah. Yeah, I know my parents are in Colorado and they've had, you know, insurance issues because they live in a rural area and, you know, prone to wildfire. So big problem. Let's see. There's some others that have come in. Um, in your third or fourth slide of your presentation, the map, uh, there is written moose limit. What did that mean? I am looking at it, and I think it says moose expansion. So what? It, but, yeah, maybe you can explain if, either way that it's referring to. I think for moose expansion, there was a period of time where um, moose were expanding more northward. Um, into areas that didn't traditionally see moose, you know, kind of as um, vegetation changed um, and, and things like temperature. Yeah. So Sarah, are, are you saying also that moose are moving or some wildlife is moving further north than they typically or sooner than they typically do? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question is, has the fossil fuel industry in Alaska acknowledged the effects of climate change on Alaska native communities and or their role in climate change? And have they provided any assistance with climate change mitigation? I am not a great person to answer that question. Um, I... And that's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, so that's okay if it's a little out of your scope, so. Yeah. I'm sure it's another, out there, but my mind is like blanking right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one is, do any of the communities try to identify young people who are interested in a profession such as nursing and then assisting them with school tuition, et cetera, with the intent that they will return home to help the community thrive through their care? Yes that um that does exist i know there's a couple different types of programs um especially now there's with uh having virtual you know capabilities there's um, efforts to actually train people in their community as much as possible because um, what does happen is when you pull someone from a community to you know maybe attend school in anchorage it just still it is hard to get back to their community for a number of reasons so you know allowing someone and supporting them and living where they um, are from is one strategy to help deal with that. Um, but there's definitely different models out there for, for getting rural folks trained um, and able to you know, stay in their community and provide services to them. Um, let's see, there's another one. Might more people begin to accept the climate is changing as they realize a direct and negative impact on the quality of their life. Yeah, I think, and granted, I, I mean, it's seen in a like very specific space in Alaska, but it does seem like up here, especially because people can pretty clearly see some of the changes that have happened, that it um, is more accepted and, you know, there's more dialogue about it. I, I think still, you know, people don't talk too much about the whys of, of climate change. And, you know, that's really not my, um, like, I'm not trying to impact that very much. But what, you know, is important is we're all understanding, like, yes, these changes are happening. And, you know, there are some things we can do to address them and prepare for them. Yes, and someone else also mentioned that, uh, that most people probably accept that cli the climate is changing. Uh, but maybe not always uh, the reasons for it. 
Yeah, especially when, you know, you a lot of people in the state, they're either tied to the land for, you know, food resources, for recreational resources. You know, a lot of people came up to Alaska to get um, winters. Um, and then you have, you know, commercial fishing industries and stuff. So a lot of different segments of the population can see, you know, how um, climate is changing here. Um, someone else asked, um, have some Alaska community, communities already had to relocate due to the effects of climate change? And are there any predictions as to how many Alaskans may have to relocate in the future? Yes, um, I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but there is a report, um, I can see if I can find the link and add it, but the Denali Commission um, put out a report on environmentally threatened communities um, where it laid out how many communities might need to relocate um, and like what the driving hazard was. The Unmet News report that I mentioned also shares some of that information. Um, I do know there are a couple of communities thinking about relocating. There, um, there's some that have started the process. The community of Newtalk has begun to relocate to Muktavik. Uh, and from what I last heard is some of the services have been relocated and some of the things have not quite yet been relocated. And it's just been really challenging to have the right sustainable funding support through every step of the relocation. It's kind of, you know, every federal agency has a bit more of a different jurisdiction. So the community has had to kind of hopscotch their um, assistance a little bit. So you, you have like the schools in one, one community, you have the post office in the other. So it's um, pretty challenging um, at the moment, but the, uh, you can read a little bit about that in the Unmet Needs Report as well. And I see uh, Freya has uh, included a couple of links there that may also have some information as well. Um, and another question, is there a difference in attitude of Alaska Natives versus others? And I'm not um, sure, Janice, if you're referring to something specific in that. I, I'm referring to non-natives. Um, and the reason I asked, um, a friend of mine recently uh, retired. And for the last 30 years, she was a nurse in Alaska. And we've had many conversations where she talks about the difference in attitudes with the natives, the Alaskan natives versus um, others um, or, or non-natives. So, and, 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 and remembering some of the conversations, uh, it appears the Alaskan natives have more of a, 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 um, a spiritual connectedness to the land, understanding the climate, and I'm, I'm just wondering how, or is there, or have you noticed there's a difference in some perceptions of how we are, how we, what we owe the land and, and nature versus others? I hope I made that clear. I apologize if I didn't. Yeah, that was helpful explanation. Thank you. Um, I'm not Alaska Native, and I, so I don't want to, you know, speak for for them or the communities. But um, what I, I I do see is, you know, just that really close connection to the land, and you know, the really the um, you know the millennium of stewardship of the the land um, definitely leads to some different um, ways of viewing these changes and. Um, you know, seeing the importance to, um, you know, observe them and respond to them is, is different than what you see in communities who may not really have that same, um, same tie culturally and historically to the area. Thank and you. I think um, someone also, also put a link in there that uh, from the Denali Commission report um, that may also have information about that. Yeah, I think that's the right one for the list of how many, and then, so that report has some financial information, I know that's part of the question, as well as the um, news report also has, like, how much is it gonna cost to do this kind of thing, even a, a low estimate. Uh, oh, 
And Freya also says the book Early Warming by Nancy Lord may also be mm -hmm. of interest to um, that last question. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that I had uh, regarding your presentation, Sarah, was, you know, um, what, and I don't know if you can address this, but uh, what are some of the um, effects of the cli of climate change on Alaska um, that might be filtered down or affecting the rest of the U.S. as well as globally? Yeah, I think one um, that comes to mind, and actually um, something, it, it's kind of a weird answer, but I'm, I'm going to go for it. Um, there's a lot of climate related work happening in the state. There's a lot of drive to do more. And I think there is a there's also a lot of you know funding coming in for infrastructure, um, you know, improvements and new projects. And Alaska doesn't have all the technical, you know, capacity, um, all the trained people here. So pulling from other areas you know, around the, the country and the world to help with some of this climate work, I think is, is something interesting of an impact that we don't really talk about a lot, like pulling um, people resources from other places. Uh, that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, as, as I kind of shared, there's, there's people who come to Alaska so they can have winters. Um, I think we, we see some of that, that, you know, people are, um, interested in coming to Alaska because you know they're tired of like seeing so many hot summers and yeah we get wildfires up here but maybe it's not as dramatic as it has been you know on the west coast um especially in recent years so those are some impacts that I think trickle down to other other states that I can think of um and there was actually a a book um a fictional book that had Anchorage become the new capital of the U.S there are so many climate refugees. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and we've got a lot of oil and gas up here and other kind of extractive things happening um, that a lot of these, you know, they're designed on permafrost and other other things um, that that change as climate changes and you know how how will those systems be impacted um, in terms of like you know being able to continue to deliver those things. So that's what comes to mind for me. <laughs> I think there's a lot of things that we don't even think about that um, yeah. may have an impact uh, and you may not know it until it happens. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, someone had also asked about internet and cell phone coverage in Alaska, especially yeah. in remote areas. Um, someone already answered that, but if you feel like, uh, if you want to add anything, that is yeah. welcome as well. I think it's a great question. Um, I think it's interesting because there have been so many improvements around the state. There's been a lot more broadband connection, but um, like, I forget the technical term, but something happened to the broadband network up um, in Northern Alaska and they didn't even have any internet services. So they're, you know, the services are pretty vulnerable. It took a long time for an adequate repair. Um, it's really awesome that more people can join things virtually and have this, you know, more remote training, but like it, it often seems like day to day um, internet availability is a little different. I could be on a Zoom call with someone in a community who was able to share their video and do all this stuff. And then the next day, like they can't even access Zoom. So it's pretty inconsistent still, but um, some improvements. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, it's now time for our uh, additional engagement, and I just wanted to go ahead and share my screen for that. So um, I want to thank you, Sarah, for giving this great presentation. And um, now we have this time to talk a little further. Uh, we appreciate your questions and comments in the chat, but uh, now we would like to go a little bit further with that. I have a Padlet where you can add your thoughts and to some questions, and then we can discuss those together. Um, we will just all stay together in the same room. And um, let me go ahead, and I think in the chat, someone is going to put that uh, link to the Padlet.
And I will go ahead and uh, share my screen regarding that. Sorry about that. And here you can see um, the Padlet here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these or not. Uh, these are not required for you to fill out, but you can also continue using the chat and putting comments in there. But what you do would be um, click on the plus under each of the questions, and you can, you don't have to put a subject, you can just write something. You can also respond by putting um, a heart or a thumbs up to someone's comment as well, or anything that they have posted. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a little time the comments are anonymous, so don't uh, worry about that. And um, then we will have a little discussion. So let me give you a minute to kind of get acclimated to the Padlet, to think about these questions, and then we'll start um, our discussion. So the three questions, just uh, just to make sure that everyone knows what they are, is what is the biggest environmental health concern in your part of the country? Another question is what does your organization currently address um, the, inter the intersection of climate change and health outcomes? And the third question is what might your organization do in the future to address the intersection of climate change and health outcomes? And even if you're not sure which category it might go into, feel free to just go ahead and post. Um, they kind of uh, intersect and um, could apply to uh, either of the categories. So if you want to see what other people are putting down, there's a little slide here on the, the right of each one. And you can see what other people have written. And again, you can use these little, um, you can add a comment, or you can uh, also have a reaction to any of the um, posts. So I see here uh, some of the biggest environmental health concerns are hurricanes, PFAS, Contam water quality and contamination, pesticides with mercury in the lakes from acid rain, uh, some old lead pipes, so a lot of water contamination, extreme weather, such as flooding and tornadoes and heat, uh, drought, uh, particles linked to diesel fueled school buses or other transportation. Someone in Salt Lake City is saying that is uh, the lake is getting dangerously low, and that uh, harmful chemicals are then released into the air. Again, lots of air and water issues, warming temperatures, unpredictable weather, uh, some mining and wild uh, fires. and um, flooding and air pollution again. So let's see, how does your organization currently address the intersection of climate change and health outcomes? 
So um, some people have said we have coalitions in place that include scientists, ski resorts, and physicians. So lots of different disciplines are involved. Um, This one here is saying that uh, when a majority of your institution is tasked with energy research, with the largest donation made by billion oil man Harold Ham, it is difficult to feel job safety and speaking up. Um, reducing waste and electric use, improving air quality. And there are a lot of uh, continuing and new research related to climate and students have been protesting for years about the um, use by uh, University of Fossil Fuels. And did anybody want to share uh, verbally about anything that they're thinking about doing in the future? Um, you're free to read through here, but if anybody would like to share about what they are doing or what they are hoping to do, their organizations. funding. And Sarah, like your organization, um, is that how a lot of um, things are being done in Alaska is having communities um, work with organizations like yours in order to um, address some of the issues that they're facing? I would say it's, a, it's one of the strategies. Um, it can be really tough for a community or a tribe to, you know, apply for funding and you know be able to manage the funding, and so there are agencies like like um, ANTHC that that help um, that process so that they can get you know funding and do the projects that they need. Um, there are there's a lot of different funding things out there that I think communities are using in different ways. There's also a lot of research happening that. Um, such as through the University of Alaska, um, Fairbanks, also um, other campuses such as the Anchorage campus where um, researchers are trying to really collaborate with communities and you know, have more community driven projects um, so they can you know, fully participate and be engaged um, in this work. Yes, it sounds really complex and probably overwhelming to a lot of people, but um, I, I think knowing that there's organizations like yours out there to help with that um, is at least one step. Yeah, I think even knowing all the different work going on in one state around climate, and even if you just do climate and health, it's there's a lot out there. <laughs> um, and I'm sure other states are like that too, which is great, but also, provide some opportunity to make sure that we're not all siloed and that we're talking to each other and kind of sharing um, what we're working on. Ooh, I just saw one about in integrating environmental health curriculum into more schools, love that. Oh, which one is that? It was, the... Yeah, if you scroll back up a little bit. Okay, oops, sorry about that. A little too much, there we go. Oh. I think it's down a little more. Okay. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Integrate environmental health curriculums into trainings. I really like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, our first session of the series was about environmental health literacy and just learning yeah. about, um, you know, understanding environmental health. I think it's really important. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, not to put you on the spot again, Sarah, but are there tools for individuals uh, to use as well to help with this, or is this more of a, a organizational um, endeavor that for people? I think it kind of depends on where the person's at in their community. Um, you know, I mentioned that National Crime Assessment and Share Link um, that gives some more like regionally relevant information, and I think in there there's some tools that you know, people can consider. Um, one thing 
we do find, especially when you're talking about, you know, people um, and, you know, more like their mental health response to, you know, unknown changes in their environment is just doing something really, really helps with that. So like, you know, just finding something smaller you can do in your community or even in your own home, you know, is a really nice step into, into this work. Um, I, I read, and, you know, I'm not endorsing anything that I'm sharing, but like, I, I read the Saving Us um, book and Catherine Hayhoe was the writer and just, you know, talking about, um, it, you know, more of like the, having the, the difficult conversation about climate um, and our, our roles and like what we can do, but there were some really interesting like local, uh, sorry, individual tools that were suggested in there. So that, that could be a fun resource for someone if they want to take a trip to the library and find that book. <laughs> yes, uh, a book discussion is always a good um, option to get at least the conversation going and uh, people to start thinking about that what they can do even on a small level. And um, that's kind of why I mentioned it because some of the comments here, you know, that some of the larger organizations, it's kind of, you know, they're getting funding or um, mm -hmm. endowments from companies that may have some connections to like um, some of the industries that are impacting the environment. And um, yeah, yeah, so it's good to know what people can do also on a smaller scale. Yeah, and you know, one thing is, you know, it doesn't have to be specific to climate change to impact how re resilient communities are to respond to climate change. You know, if you're improving health system access, that then is is great down the road if there are you know potential health impacts that you know in a community that, um, need to be addressed. So, you know, addressing some of these other other issues in a community or a state still helps um, when it turns you're thinking. Turn, turn the the lens onto climate change. Yes, I even like this one here. You know, students and clinicians are discussing excessive waste mm -hmm. produced in healthcare settings. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate everyone contributing to the Padlet and with your questions for uh, our presenter. Um, let me go ahead and um, do one more slide here before we go. I just want to again thank um, Sarah for her presentation and for all of you to in participating in this conversation. If you are interested in claiming the Medical Library Association CE credit and the chess for this, the link is in the chat. And as you take the evaluation, if you answer yes to wanting the CE, please make sure to pay close attention as a CE code and additional instructions will appear. And if you haven't already, consider registering for the upcoming sessions of this series. The next one is tomorrow regarding social and economic determinants of health with Dr. Sandro Galea. And don't forget our accompanying guide. Each session has its own tab with information about the speaker and links to related information resources. And the recordings will also be linked there as well as on our YouTube channel. So, uh, you can look in our chat uh, for those links and for social media posts um, for the series, please use the hashtag SDOEH24. And again, thank you all for attending and participating. And thank you, Sarah, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, we really enjoyed having you here and we hope to see the rest of you in future sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.